Next talk will be by Maria Colomitace, who's a junior group leader at the Hammond Center, and she will be speaking about EpiScanPy, epigenomic single cell analysis. I wonder if you also have already a, a logo for that. We're thinking about it. We are wondering whether we should put a scampi or a butterfly on it. Um, do you hear me? Yeah, okay. Maybe too much even. Okay, I guess. Do I have to do something? Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, like um, Fabian said already, I will be talking about the tool that we have developed for the analysis of single cell epigenomics data. And I actually wanted to thank the organizers for giving us a chance to present this work uh, today. Um, so in my group, we are mainly interested in the layer of regulation that lies between the genome and the transcriptome. So we are not so much interested on the single cell transcriptomics per se. Um, so uh, we are interested in basically this uh, epigenetic layer that lies between genome and transcriptome and that by nature give us not just information about the genes but gives us uh, whole genome information about our cells. Um, there are many different technologies that allow us to profile the epigenome of single cell at the moment. I uh, would say the most used ones are um, single cell bisulfide sequencing or similar techniques for the analysis of DNA methylation and single cell ataxic for the analysis of open chromatin. And we have uh, seen in the last couple of years studies that start to really profile a lot of cells, a few thousand cells, and now with the uh, uh, microfluidic techniques for single cell ataxic, I'm sure there will be um, more and more cells coming. So for that reason, we decided to uh, develop a pipeline for the analysis of single cell DNA methylation and single cell ataxic data, um, which is completely integrated into the SCAMPI platform that you may know about, which was uh, developed in the group of Fabian Thais, also at the ICB. Um, and what we've done is that we've built it in a, a modular way that allows you to uh, basically integrate more and more different single cell omics techniques that will um, arise in the next years, hopefully, and also to do uh, multi-omic data analysis. So this is how the, the pipeline works. So first of all, we do a feature selection, and this is now not working anymore. Something else I can do. Ah, there we go, good. So uh, why do we need to do feature selection and this is yet not working? Um, okay, the laptop is not related, thank you. But this should be, where do I have to point? The laser is working, the pointer. Sorry, Ooh, there will be a lot of clicking. Uh, Okay, so uh, when you do single cell RNA seq, you basically don't worry about your feature space because you're measuring genes, so you basically quantify uh, per cell the expression of every one of the genes. But once you measure the epigenome, you basically have whole genome information. So there you need to start worrying, what do I want to quantify? And there what we have done in our pipeline is that you can basically, um, um, basically use different feature spaces. You can, for example, say I'm interested in genes. For example, I want to know what's the average openness or DNA methylation in genes or in peaks, obviously, for single cell RNA, uh, single cell ataxic, sorry. Um, I can also be interested in what's the average openness in promoters or enhancers, uh, same for DNA methylation, transcription factor binding sites, topics, anything that you can think of. And of course, you can also say, no, no, I want to keep really all the information, I want to look at the whole genome, so I'm going to make windows, whatever size, depending on how much missing data I have, and then I will quantify these windows. Okay, so this is for the feature selection, and then we need to quantify how much every one of the, um, whether it's a taxic or DNA methylation, what's the average in every one of these features. And once we have that, it's basically very easy because then we can calculate the similarity between any two cells um, based on some kind of distance metrics. And based on that, we can do all the standard uh, downstream analysis, such as uh, low dimensional visualization, clustering, differential calling based on DNA methylation or open chromatin. And this differential calling then will allow us to um, annotate the different clusters, and then, of course, we can also do pseudotemporal ordering if we have the correct data set. So I will tell you about two different examples, one for DNA methylation and one for single cell ataxic. So in the DNA methylation one, we basically got data from Joe Ecker's group that published one of the biggest single cell DNA methylation studies in which they profiled more than 3,000 neurons, very low coverage, less than 5% of the genome is covered per cell, um, and they did some um, single nucleus uh, DNA methylation measurement. So what do we do here? Um, we uh, first get the individual methylation status per cytosine, 
And then we build account matrices, so we basically load some kind of features that we are interested in. In this example here will be enhancers. We then calculate the average methylation level per feature with the minimum coverage. So in this case, for example, we say at least one side is in covered in that feature. Um, and then if necessary, we can filter cells which are not covered enough. We can also do some imputation of the methylation data. And basically, we can calculate as many count matrices as features we are interested in. So um, then we can do low dimensional data representation. So we do PCA, uh, TSNI, UMAP, et cetera. And then we can uh, plot it here. And then we can also do Louvain clustering. So it's basically the same plot as before, but with the clusters assigned um, to the different cell types. We can do that for windows, for promoters, for enhancers, for gene bodies. And the interesting thing is that we see the clustering looks less or more tight depending on the features that we are using, which we think it's kind of interesting from a biological point of view. Um, if we compare what cells are assigned to what cluster depending on the features, this is a, a heat map and what we see is that in general cells are assigned to the same group no matter what feature space we are using. But then the question is what are these cells? And for that what we do is that we rank these differentially methylated features between clusters and we can obviously do it based on any one of our feature spaces but we decide to look at promoters just because it's easier to interpret. Um, so what we do is that we can uh, rank these promoters. For example, here, I choose just these uh, four um, clusters, and I ask which ones are the most differential promoters between this blue cluster and all the rest, and I get uh, a gene, ARHGF6, which is very differentially methylated between these uh, four clusters. I can also see it here. And then it turns out that this gene is differentially expressed in NDNF neurons, so from that I can and obviously many other genes, I can uh, then say, okay, then this blue cluster is most likely this neuron type, and I can do the same thing for the other uh, types. Um, we actually get some interesting hits on the top of these most differentially uh, um, methylated promoters. For example, we get this RAP4A, which is very differential uh, methylated between these uh, two cell types and these two cell types, as we can see here too. But if we look at the adult brain, which is where this data is coming from, at the level of um, RNA-6, so gene expression, we see that this gene is not differentially expressed between these cell types. And what we actually have seen is that, uh, looking at the literature, this gene is actually differentially expressed during development of the brain. So it looks as if the um, DNA methylation level still remembers the developmental path that these cells took to get to this uh, mature brain, while the, DNA, um, the gene expression doesn't remember anymore. So this is this idea that um, the DNA methylation is kind of recording the past and not just giving you a snapshot of the cell types you have at that moment. Um, so yeah, basically what we can do is that we can get a set of markers, in this case promoters, which are the most differentially methylated between any one of these clusters and the rest. And then um, knowing a little bit of biology, or in our case talking to people that know about brain biology, uh, we got to find out which one is the most likely cell type in every one of these clusters, and uh, then we can uh, just um, assign every cluster to a cell type. Okay, so this was for DNA methylation. We've also uh, looked at an example of single cell ataxic data. Um, that we uh, got from this uh, Kuzanovich et al. Atlas paper that was published last year. Um, so there uh, they've uh, profiled, I think, 13 different tissues from which at the beginning we only looked at brain to have the comparison with the DNA methylation atlas, uh, but then we also looked at bone marrow uh, um, data. So what we do there, we get the accessibility reads in every one of the peaks, we construct the count matrices, um, and then we can do low dimensional data representation, clustering, et cetera, the same ways as we did with DNA methylation. I just want to show you this as a kind of a word of caution. This is the raw ataxic data, um, and this is the low dimensional representation and the clustering that you get, which doesn't look very pretty. Um, and then uh, the important thing here is that you actually need to normalize your data. So we regressed out the number of peaks per cell. And then what we also did is that we removed cells which were very lowly covered. And what we see is that there in a taxic there is still kind of a lot of work that can be done for different like normalization techniques, uh, um, topic um, or feature selection techniques, et cetera. So we've basically um, done clustering based on peaks, based also on other features like for DNA methylation. Here I'm showing you just for enhancers. And then, like with DNA methylation, we can ask uh, which ones are the most differential peaks uh, to be open between any one of these clusters. And we get a list here. Obviously, you're not supposed to uh, read any of the things in this list, but you can see that there are like blocks which are more open in every one of the different cell types compared to the rest. 
Um, and then we basically, how do we get to know what cell types we are talking about here? Well, we just look uh, what genes are these uh, peaks associated with. And then, for example, we see, well, there is a gene that marks for oligodendrocytes that is more open here. So we deduce based on these genes and many others that this cell type here is most likely oligodendrocytes. We do the same thing for neurons, which are mainly open in these two cluster here. We can do the same thing for microglia, which are based here, and astrocytes, for example. So basically, the same ways as with DNA methylation, we can look at ranking of the most differential open peaks, and from that, determine what are the different cell types that we have here. And um, then we actually also uh, used a, a bone marrow data set, uh, mainly because this is a differentiation, a differentiation uh, data set, so we thought it would be interesting to look into that. Um, we performed clustering also there, uh, cell type identification of our different clusters, and then the nice thing is that very easily uh, we can do diffusion pseudotime on this ataxic data, and what we get is a, a, a diffusion plot where we see that the progenitors are here in this branch, and then they differentiate into um, erythrocytes on this side, and T cells and B cells on the other side. So this also works kind of out of the box for the single cell ataxic data. Um, Okay, so um, I've shown you this uh, platform Episcampi, which is for the analysis at the moment for DNA, single cell DNA methylation and single cell ataxic, but can be, uh, it's uh, built in a, a modular way such that it can integrate many other different potential single cell epigenomic measurements and also merge single cell transcriptomics and epigenomics. Um, it allows you for this semi-automated cell type annotation and identification based on this ranking of the different features, which I think it's very interesting because in other methods, when we use windows, for example, it's much more difficult to decide which ones are my cell types. And then it's fully integrated in this SCAMPI pipeline. I don't know if you've used it for a single cell transcriptomics data, but it therefore kind of inherits all the functions that come with the SCAMPI platform. And it's available on GitHub. Uh, yeah, so this work has been done on ICB in my group, mainly done by uh, Anna Danesi, which is here in the audience, together with a master student, Maria, and of course with um, help from Fabian's group. Thanks. Thanks, Maria. There was a tour de force of processing, uh, methylation, and a taxi day. We have time for questions. Oh, no. Very nice, Maria. Thanks a lot. Um, I was wondering, I guess you played around a bit with size of the windows because you have somehow to reduce resolution, right? So I was wondering what is reasonable both on ataxic and DNA methylation to use in your experience in terms of window size to get to decent results. So this data set here, for example, for DNA methylation was extremely low coverage. Uh, that's why we chose 100 KB windows. We also tried with uh, 50 KB windows, uh, but then didn't look as nice. But interestingly, enhancers looked amazing. So Windows doesn't seem to really show you kind of out of the box such nice clustering uh, between cells. So then you're saying that it's two kilobases. Two kilobases. Okay. I, th I think this pre-processing, basically how you summarize data, if you just go to Windows or, yeah. I mean, people have been looking to topic models again, right, I think. From yeah. I think, is, isn't Stein a is he also in Leuven? <laughs> yeah, right, I mean, he has been, you guys have this cis topic type of thing, right? Yeah. This other approach, I think it's, it's an interesting question. Yeah. But I like the approach to having multiple features, maybe. It's quite, quite cool. Sam? I think even with um, topic models, they have to still choose the feature space, Fabian. Anyway, I just wondered if you might be able to somehow infer the right kinds of features based on some sort of joint Analysis. I don't know if you would have insight in, you know, having looked at some of these data sets, but it seems to me like Windows, it makes a lot of sense to me that that wouldn't be a meaningful unit. And enhancers, you know, we have to have already identified them, and yeah. uh, they're, I mean, it's a good starting place, but maybe we should be trying to learn from the data what the right features are, or how they look, or something like that. And I don't know if, if you know of anything that's doing that, or if it's always just some sort of uh, pre-annotated kind of set. So... In this case, we've only used the pre-annotated ones, but obviously we are thinking a lot along the same lines because we think that we basically put our knowledge and then we ask what's there. So it would be nicer to ask instead the data, what is the most variable? As you say, one of the things that we've been discussing a lot is that even if you do, for example, cis topic or, or any kind of, you still need to start with building your count matrix. 
And what do you put there? If you start with peaks already, like how many peaks will you put? Um, um, how many peaks do I even need to really be able to decide what is a cell type? Um, yeah, we've been thinking a lot along these lines. Um, and what we would also want to do is even with the features that we've chosen now here, we've kept them separately. So we've tried only enhancers, only promoters. Obviously, we could start merging them. And we could start merging them and asking which one of my features has more weight for determining the different cell types. Um, I've shown you in the heat map, it looks like kind of the cell types, the cells seem to be assigned to the same cluster, no matter what features I use. But some cells are not. What's going on with these cells? If you look at the differentiation trajectory, this may be even more interesting. Maybe enhancers give me more a view into the past or the future than would promoters do. Or So we are thinking a lot along these lines, but we haven't found a solution yet. So kind of a technical question. When you have uh, a tag seq or a uh, bisulfide sequencing, the number of uh, if you're looking at genes, it's like 20,000. But if you're looking at this data, it's like one order of magnitude larger. So uh, how good is the processing scaling to this number of things? Or do you really need to do the feature selection in order to fit large matrices into memory? So if you can comment on that. Yeah, so at the moment we do feature selection also because of that reason. Uh, we are thinking how to optimize the processes to Basically, for RNA-seq, in this direction, it would never grow because I would never have more genes. So everything is optimized for growing in this direction on the number of cells. And I can load more than a million cells, and everything works perfectly. But if I load more than a million features, it doesn't work anymore. So um, at the moment, we are just taking the shortcut. We just remove features which are non-variable, which are too variable and are most likely noise, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but we need to start optimizing the processes in that direction. This was an interesting discussion. This was basically about, about feature, I think, I think very related, the three of you, like feature learning on, on, on the, those sets. And, you know, I, I, I think this neural network aspect might be potentially an approach. Because that's like, we can do convolutions on, on the attack. I think I'd like to see it. Well, that, that's, we, we spoke about neural topic models and stuff like that. People like this. I wonder how, how this will develop. I think we should close it here. Thanks again for a nice presentation. Thank you.